Today, the South Carolina governor has been labeled a hero on the international stage. For those that don't have our back, we're taking names. David Brody speaks with UN Ambassador Nikki Haley. You have to strengthen your faith. You have to. Plus, Bishop Harry Jackson shares how the church can bridge the racial divide. Then, I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. A meth cook on the road to ruin. I always knew that if I died, I was going to hell. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club, a rare sign of unity in our nation's capital. Last night, Republicans and Democrats played a baseball game. More than 25,000 people showed up to the game. They saw the Democrats walk away with the victory, and members of both parties put the bitterness of politics aside. Eric Rosales has more. Democrats at bat, Teague of Texas. It's an annual charity baseball game, a tradition dating back to 1909. USA! But this year, after the Alexandria shooting, which left House Majority Whip Congressman Steve Scalise in critical condition and three others hurt, Plain meant more than charity. It was for healing. First, Democrats and Republicans gathered around second base to pray at the spot where Scalise was shot. And then a message from President Donald Trump. By playing tonight, you are showing the world that we will not be intimidated by threats, acts of violence, or assaults on our democracy. The game will go on. I want to take a moment to send our thoughts, love, and prayers to Congressman Steve Scalise and his entire family. And the first pitch thrown by injured Capitol Police Officer David Bailey, one of the two officers on the Congressman's security detail who've been credited with saving his life and potentially many others. When you walk into Nationals Ballpark, you not only run into Teddy here, yeah, Teddy, you also see an increased police presence both inside and outside the ballpark. There are a number of police officers walking around just to make sure everyone is safe. Many wanted to show up to the game to support America. We've never been to a congressional baseball game before. We think this is a historic occasion and we want to show our support, especially for uh, Congressman Scalise, but for everybody. And I'm tired of just seeing all the, the division and everything and violence is not the way to handle the situation. The FBI is still asking Northern Virginians for help in trying to determine a motive behind the attack. They want to speak with anyone who had contact with 66-year-old James Hodgkinson, who agents say was living out of his white cargo van in the Alexandria area since March of this year. As for Congressman Scalise, doctors say the bullet hit him in the hip and then traveled through his internal organs. Hospital staff tell CBN News he will likely undergo more surgeries. Meanwhile, the other victims, including Capitol Police Officer Crystal Greiner, are expected to recover. On Capitol Hill, Wednesday's shooting jolted many lawmakers, leaving them feeling vulnerable. Some say it brought back painful memories of the shooting six years ago involving former Representative Gabby Giffords. CBN News spoke with several lawmakers who say it's a fine line to be available to constituents and still be safe. Many say they don't need extra security. I like being able to hear from people, whether they agree or disagree, I want that opportunity to explain why I believe the way that I do, whether it's personal responsibility or limited government. Others say for certain events, they wouldn't mind the extra security. <laughs> the real winners, the charities of the game, which included the Capitol Police Memorial Fund. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Uh, it's wonderful to see unity in the nation's capital, and let's hope that continues. Uh, that would be a wonderful thing. Uh, the charities received a million dollars last night, and so that's wonderful news for all of them, and I'm glad that the Capitol Police are part of that. In other good news, the Russian military has claimed it's killed the top leader of ISIS. Efren Graham has more about that from our CBN newsroom. Efrem? Gordon, Russia claims a recent airstrike wiped out the leader of the Islamic State Caliphate, but Russia's foreign minister cautions, even if it's true, it does not mean the end of ISIS. As Shelly and Aaron reports, we've heard rumors before about the ISIS leader's death. 
The Russian Defense Ministry believes ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was killed in a Russian strike in late May, along with other senior group commanders. In a statement, Russia claims the airstrike was carried out during a meeting of ISIS leaders outside the group's de facto capital of Raqqa in Syria. The report of al-Baghdadi's possible death comes as ISIS suffers major setbacks. U.S. and coalition forces have been ramping up the pressure in their battle against ISIS in Syria. Secretary of Defense James Mattis told CBS News that his order from President Trump is to eliminate the Islamic terror group once and for all. We have already shifted from attrition tactics where we shove them from one position to another in Iraq and Syria to annihilation tactics where we surround them. Russia's defense ministry says their air raid came as ISIS leaders were plotting their escape from Raqqa as the pressure was mounting. They say the strike killed about 30 mid-level ISIS leaders and about 300 fighters. Meanwhile, a spokesman for the U.S.-led anti-Islamic state coalition says he cannot confirm reports that al-Baghdadi has been killed. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. President Trump is looking to make good on his campaign promise when it comes to the communist island nation of Cuba. While visiting Miami today, he's announcing changes to the deal President Obama made with Cuba. President Trump's goal is to stop cash from flowing to the Cuban military and security services. The new policy would keep diplomatic relations and allow U.S. airlines and cruise ships to continue servicing the island. The United Methodist Church is raising some eyebrows after appointing its first non-binary transgender deacon. Reverend M. Barclay came out as lesbian while studying theology and training to become a Methodist minister, then later became transgender. Those years were filled with uncertainty and a crisis of belief. Barclay now does not identify with either gender and does not like the pronouns he and she. Instead, Barclay re prefers to be referred to as they. This weekend, dads will open cards, gifts, and maybe even be treated to dinner for Father's Day. John Jessup introduces us to one son who's honoring his father 365 days a year. Jonathan Hayden wears many hats, teacher, son, and now caregiver. These are the projects that need to be taken care of. It is hard to see a man, especially a man of his stature you know, what he's done to see him like this. Jonathan grew up in this Northeast Washington, D.C. neighborhood until a few years ago when he bought his own home. He had no idea a few years later he'd be back to take care of his aging mom and dad who has dementia. I tend to think that he's maybe had signs of it for a long time. He'd never been much on remembering things. Jonathan is also part of a trend as almost 45 percent of today's caregivers in America are men. 20 years ago, it was half that. Let me tell you about the toughest guy on earth. He does the work of two jobs. Jonathan admits it's a challenge not only dealing with his father's memory loss, but also his sometimes combative personality. My father has said some things that have hurt me to the core. Hurt me to the core, left me out of there crying. Although it helps him learn about patience and forgiveness. But we have to be patient with the person and recognize that, that they cannot control what it is that they're doing and that is not their fault. He credits his faith, friends, and the sense of community from a support group for caregivers, something a lot of men don't have. Men tend to kind of suck it up, if you will, uh, and take it in strive, not really kind of looking for the help that they need. That poses some potential health challenges. So Actually. this looks like this may be you. Is that you? That is me. <laughs> and who's that lovely lady next to you? That's Jackie. Jonathan's father says he's not perfect, but he's grateful for his son willing to step up and offer a helping hand. Very helpful. He makes a tremendous difference, a tremendous difference. Though it's an unexpected role, it's one he says he proudly accepts. And there's nothing feminine or less masculine about be, taking, being a caretaker, being a nurse, whatever you want to call it. You have to because they're your parents. John Jessup, CBN News, Washington. Honoring thy father and mother that thy days may be long on this earth. Gordon, happy yeah. Father's Day to you. And happy Father's Day to you. And happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. I hope you get a wonderful day of rest. Terry? Mm -hmm. Well, coming up, she's America's new UN ambassador, and she's standing up for human rights around the world. Whether it's religious persecution, we're starting to see all of those things, and it's just hard. But at the end of the day, I need to let God do. And so that's the way I look at it.
Stay tuned for our exclusive interview with Nikki Haley when we come back. Well, President Trump has a reputation for being tough and bold, so it's no surprise he chose Nikki Haley as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. As CBN's David Brody reports, the former governor has been shaking up the U.N. while standing firmly for Israel. Don't let the southern accent fool you. Good morning. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley means business in her new role at the United Nations. For those that don't have our back, we're taking names. As U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Haley has begun to shake things up at this international body, which has received plenty of criticism from its host country. That's where we began our one-on-one -on -one conversation in New York. Well, I thought I needed to make how this community was going to see the United States. I thought that it was my job to go and start the positioning that. And it was that the United States is leading again and that they were going to see true leadership. But more importantly, they were going to know what the U.S. was for, what the U.S. was against, and there would be no gray area. Israel is right at the top of that list. The United States is determined to stand up to the U.N.'s anti-Israel bias. Long gone are the days when President Obama's U.N. ambassador abstained from a vote that labeled Israel's settlements a flagrant violation under international law. It's been abusive. Like, it really has. I was floored when I got here at how biased um, they were against Israel. On the smallest things to the biggest things, it was almost like the U.N. community just bullied Israel. Her action led to a hero's welcome in Israel this month. Thank you for all your help in standing up for Israel, standing up for the truth, which is uh, standing up for America. Haley feels defending Israel is a moral obligation to do what's right. She recalls sitting through meetings where country after country went after the Jewish state. I got mad. It was just unacceptable. And so what I did was I just called them out. And I, you know, just said, I can't believe in times where we've got issues with North Korea and Syria and we're dealing with Russia and China, you're going to sit there and spend every single month like you have for the last 10 years on an Israel bashing session. It just blows my mind. Haley's hit list is long. The U.S. is considering pulling out of the U.N.'s questionable Human Rights Council, considering that countries involved in it also commit abuses. The Venezuelan people have been robbed of their human rights. And yet, not once has the Human Rights Council seen fit to condemn Venezuela. And Russia doesn't get a pass, especially over its relationship with the Syrian government. If Russia has the influence in Syria that it claims to have, we need to see them use it. We need to see them put an end to these horrific acts. How many more children have to die before Russia cares? So how does Haley think the U.S. should deal with Russia? I think it depends on the issue. So I think that what you should assume is that we should always look out for the United States first and do everything we can to secure and protect American citizens. Having said that, Russia has not been very friendly with us on certain things. We've disagreed on Syria. We've disagreed on Ukraine. Um, you know, we've disagreed on certain other resolutions and issues. But we do agree on ISIS, and we do agree on how we're going to counter ISIS. Countering North Korea is another challenge, possibly the biggest. We have every right to be concerned about North Korea. This is not small potatoes when it comes to what we have to deal with. You've got um, a leader who is unbelievably paranoid about being overthrown, about being assassinated, about, you know, trying to move into his country. And the truth is the U.S., does not, is not pushing for regime change. We're not pushing for war. That's not what we want. And so we're telling them, don't give us a reason to have to do that. All of this requires faith and not one based on actions of others. Ever since I was little, I know I always wanted to have a deep, strong faith. And I always felt like I had a strong relationship to God and, you know, could talk to God during the day and all of those things that you um, that bring you peace. Raised in the Sikh faith of her Indian American family, Haley says as an adult, she became a Christian as the teachings of Jesus spoke to her. That faith surely got tested as governor after multiple tragedies in South Carolina. For me, it was hard realizing I couldn't protect everyone. 
And when that sadness and that trauma kicks in, you have to strengthen your faith. You have to. And so I think that really forced me to have to just say, all right, God, you've got to take this. I can't do it. And she realizes she has to let Jesus take the wheel here at the UN, too. I feel like now that we're in New York, you see a lot more pain. You see, um, whether it's religious persecution, whether you see chemical weapons usage, whether you see crematoriums and things like that, we're starting to see all of those things. And it's just hard. And you just have to go back to your faith because at the end of the day, the way I look at it is I have to be the strongest I can be. I have to do it with passion. I have to do it with conviction. I have to stay true to myself. But at the end of the day, I need to let God do. And so that's the way I look at it. She's leaving it all in God's hands. And clearly God is using Nikki Haley for such a time as this. David Brody, CBN News, New York. What a wonderful breath of fresh air into the UN and also into our foreign policy uh, to say, here, here's where we stand and there's no gray areas. You're going to know exactly where we stand, why we stand for it, and let's uphold the principles here uh, and let's call people into account. Uh, what a wonderful thing. And so applause <laughs> is needed. Uh, this is incredible. What common sense in so many decisions that she makes, but what strength with which she makes them, that really makes a statement, I think. Well, it's, it's sort of reasserting what I, I think has always been a hallmark of America, that we hold ourselves and the world to a moral standard. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been critiqued uh, through the years, and you, you get into, um, I think, very murky areas when you walk away from that as we're here as a force of good. Uh, and and if, you, if you depart from that and start getting into arrangements where what's our interest, what's going on, it just it, it doesn't make sense, and it's confusing to everyone. Uh, what's the motivation here? And so when you have the motivation, we want to establish righteousness, and we need to understand righteousness exalts a nation. Mm -hmm. Well, up next, a pastor's son breaks bad and starts running meth labs. There was a feeling of death all around me all the time, whether I was high or not. Watch what happens when his own father had to throw him in jail. That's next. Ron Perryman was a wanted man. For 30 years, he was hooked on meth and sold it as his full-time job. At the same time, Ron knew the FBI wanted to throw him in prison for his crimes, and the Grim Reaper wanted to drag him down to the grave. Ron Perryman knew where his life as a drug dealer and addict was leading. He was just too high to care. I knew I was not doing the right thing. And I always knew that if I died, I was going to hell. He knew because as a pastor's son, he had been held to a strict standard of right and wrong. I was required to do certain things as a, a preacher's kid. I had to uh, act a certain way. I guess I kind of started resenting that a little bit. Ron started drinking in junior high and hanging around with older kids. I definitely wanted their approval and wanted to fit in with the older kids and, uh, and be able to do what they were doing. And it felt good, getting drunk and, and, and high. If sin wasn't fun, nobody would want to do it. By high school, he was also using drugs, skipping school, and was arrested three times for DUIs. It was a very tense situation at home. I was so rebellious that I didn't want to hear anything they had to say. I didn't want to do anything they wanted to do. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. Ron dropped out of high school, worked various jobs, and at 19, was introduced to methamphetamine. Even though I knew what I should be doing spiritually from the way my parents raised me, I just let the meth control my thinking, control my life. So I started selling meth, and that way I could do what I wanted, when I wanted, and at the same time, make some pretty good money. I did very quickly start getting a sense of power. It made me feel like people didn't need me. 
Uh, they needed me for, for their drugs. Several years later, Ron was indicted by the FBI for drug trafficking. By then, Ron didn't care how his choices were affecting himself or those who loved him. Well, I must say it was very difficult to cope with. And um, even though you spend time in prayer and trust in the Lord to bring him back in his time, and Ronnie sort of, in my opinion, went from bad to worse. I was working part-time with the Sheriff's Department during the time that he was being in prison. And I was the one that had to take him into jail and sign him in. And that was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. I was just concerned about doing what I wanted to do. He was released after three and a half years. Not only did he go back to selling and using meth, he started cooking it himself. Ron continued in that lifestyle for 14 years, gunning between four meth labs in as many South Carolina counties. Then in 2012, he was busted for drug manufacturing and given five years. At the time, a number of his friends had recently died, many from drug addiction. I just felt like there was a feeling of death all around me all the time, you know, whether I was high or not. And it really bothered me. Two months into his sentence, Ron went to a jail Bible study just to get a break from his cell. Instead, he was faced with the truth of who he had become. All of my past, the drugs, all of my sins, everything just kind of overwhelmed me for some reason all of a sudden. And I knew at that moment that all I had to do was ask and accept Jesus and that I would be forgiven. You know, I got on my knees in that, in that prison cell and I said, I said, God, I just give it all to you. I, I know I've messed my life up, and I want you to take over. And he took over. I had an amazing feeling of peace come over me. The looming feeling of death that was still surrounding me, even when I went into prison, was just gone. The desire, which I still had, even though I was locked up to do meth, was gone. Uh, you know, God performed a miracle in my life. Ron spent his remaining time in prison seeking what he'd ignored his whole life. Of course, I had a lot of time on my hands being in prison, so I spent a lot of time in the Word. Granted parole in 2014, Ron walked out of prison with a renewed heart and mind. He now has a great relationship with his parents. Ron later married Lisa and says he's come to know true freedom. All of my need for acceptance from other people just was gone. Even though I'm, I'm, I'm still not proud of what I did uh, for the majority of my life, I don't have to be ashamed of it anymore. I like who I am. I like who God is, is making me, and he's still working on me every day. You know, if, when we run from a God who loves us and who has create us, created us with good and with purpose in mind, it's really a declaration of self-sufficiency. It's a rebelliousness in our hearts. That's why when we talk about coming to Jesus, we talk about surrendering our lives to Him because that's the bottom line. You know, you can know about Him, you can read about Him, you can have been taught about Him, raised in church, but until you surrender your life to him and say, God, no longer my way, I want your way, you don't really understand what it means to know him as your father, as Lord of your life, as savior of your soul. One of the things Ron said early on in that story was, if sin wasn't fun, people wouldn't do it. But you know the truth of the matter is, most of the stories that I hear of other people in my own life before I knew the Lord, I was doing what I was doing because I wanted to belong. I wanted to be accepted. It wasn't that I loved what I was doing so much. I loved the fact that I was doing it with a bunch of other people. It was a party. And yet, somewhere along the way, we come to the end of ourselves. We come to the place that Ron came to when he had, as he said, a lot of time. What did he do? He got into the Word. God's left us with a blueprint with an understanding of the why behind his creation. 
his intention and purpose for us, that he gave, came to give us hope and the future, not to destroy us, not to make us unhappy. In fact, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Why do we run from that? You know, there's something in us that wants to just be Lord of our lives, wants to just run the show. And yet, most of the time when we do that, we wind up flat on our faces. I want to say to you today, if you're not experiencing abundant life, if you're not experiencing joy to the fullest, there's a difference between happiness and joy. Joy lasts throughout anything. If you're not understanding that there is a purpose for your life, then I want to encourage you today to surrender. How do you do that? You just come to the Lord. You know, he's here all the time with us and you say, God, I'm a sinner. I get it. I have been selfish. I have been rebellious and I need you to save me. I need you to forgive my sins. I get it, Jesus. You died for me. And then ask him to help you walk in that. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, God. Teach me your ways. The Bible says, God says this, your ways are different than my ways. I'm higher than you. Surrender to that high power of God today. You will be astonished at the joy that will fill your life, the weight that will be taken off your shoulders, the focus and the direction you will come to understand, the purpose and meaning that you'll have. You might have something in your life that you need specific prayer about. Maybe you have an addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, maybe it's pornography, maybe you're struggling in your marriage, whatever it might be. We have people standing by at our phones who'd love to pray with you today. All of us are sinners who have surrendered our lives to God, and today we'd like to see you do that too. Our number's toll free. There it is on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. And we've got a wonderful packet we'd like to send you. If you pray with someone today, or maybe you just agreed that you want to pray and surrender your own life right now, this is called a new day. What do you do after you pray this prayer, after you surrender your life? It's filled with information that's been put together with you in mind, and it's your free gift from us. So call now, 1-800-700-7000. Gordon? Well, still ahead, a child nearly goes blind after playing games with his friends. See what saved his sight up next. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Devastating news for the parents of Otto Warmbier after he was released from captivity in North Korea. The former University of Virginia student has suffered serious brain damage. The brutal communist regime claims he experienced botulism and slipped into a coma after taking a sleeping pill. But doctors here in the U.S. found no evidence of that claim. Warmbier's father spoke in a news conference Thursday sharing his family's outrage over the situation and blaming both North Korea and the Obama administration. There's no excuse for the way the North Koreans treated our son and no excuse for the way they have treated so many others. I call on them to release the other Americans being held. No other family should have to endure what the warm beers have. The question is, do I think the past administration could have done more? I think the results speak for themselves. Doctors say Otto Warmbia is unresponsive and has no signs of understanding language or verbal commands. Operation Blessing recently helped a small community in Mexico get safe drinking water and even built new classrooms for children. Capaco in Sinola, Mexico has struggled with unsafe water and poor learning facilities. One kindergarten building collapsed, but Operation Blessing stepped in. Now the town has water on tap that they can drink and new classrooms that provide a safe environment for their children. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by going to its website, ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with much more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. Omkar was an active, fun-loving boy until he injured his eye in an accident. His parents were desperate to get him the surgery that he needed, but there was no way they would ever be able to afford it. We were playing a game with some sticks when one of them hit me in my right eye. 
His eye became clouded. We took him to a government clinic where they gave him medicines, a shot and ointment. But it didn't help. A traumatic cataract had formed in Omkar's right eye. His father worked in construction and did other jobs he could find around his village. But it was impossible to save enough money for cataract surgery. My wife and I were worried about our son's sight. Our son isn't reading. He stopped going to school and he doesn't even like playing games. Then a local hospital contacted CBN and told us about Omkar. We immediately arranged for him to get a free cataract surgery. When we went back to see how Omkar was doing, he was once again playing with his friends and going to school. Now I can see well. At school, I can read everything on the chalkboard. He loves to read and write. It is great. It feels so good knowing that our son is enjoying life again. Thank you very much for giving me the surgery. I'm so happy I can see clearly. Loss of vision is a terrible thing and a life impairing thing at any age. But when you're a little boy, to have that significant vision loss makes a huge difference in your life. This little guy is back out playing with his friends. More importantly, he's in school. He's able to absorb information, read what he needs to, and he's moving forward, growing up and progressing. And it's all because of your kindness. We say thank you. You know, 700 Club members, you're doing this kind of work all around the world every day. Whether it's supplying clean drinking water, helping a, a young child or a grown-up with their vision needs, their other medical needs that you meet, feeding programs, academic programs, community restoration. It's all part of what 700 Club members do around the world. And it all happens when people come together with a gift of 65 cents a day, $20 a month. If you're not a 700 Club member, you're missing out on a great opportunity to touch the world. Will you call and be a part of that now? There's the number again. It's toll free, so easy to call. 1-800-700-7000. And by the way, when you call, as a thank you to you for caring about others, we want to send you miracles. This is a DVD that we think will strengthen your faith, filled with amazing stories of God's power at work in the lives of believers. So call now. We'll get this out to you right away. Gordon? Well, coming up, Bishop Harry Jackson issues a call to the church, be the catalyst for change and bridge the racial divide. He joins us live, that's up next. Well, it's no secret that the United States of America is a nation divided. Over the last few years, riots in Ferguson, Oakland, Baltimore, and other cities have made national news. And so Bishop Harry Jackson says it's past time for the church to step up. As racial tension increases in the U.S., many people wonder how we can close the racial divide in our communities. Bishop Harry Jackson says there is hope. He gives lectures and hosts conferences about racial reconciliation. As senior pastor of Hope Christian Church in Washington, D.C., he believes the church should play a vital role in unifying people of all races. Well, Bishop Harry Jackson is here with us, and welcome back. It's great to have you with us. Good to be with you, Gordon. Um, you say that the racial divide in America is actually prophesied of in the Bible. It really is. If you look at Jesus' famous Matthew 24 passage, he says, in the last days, nation will rise again. It's a nation... The underlying Greek word, as you know, is ethnos or ethnicities. So tribalism is hardwired. Also, if you look at the Bible, the initial division that we find at the Tower of Babel, where we all were one, essentially one race, and all had one language, and because they were moving in rebellion against God, he said, I'm going to break up the unity, the false unity without God, and uh, everybody had their own language. On the day of Pentecost, however, Gordon, they came together when they all spoke in tongues uh, as the Spirit gave utterance, mm -hmm. and people heard men who they knew had not learned these languages by natural means. They realized God was unifying, reunifying humankind under the auspices of Jesus Christ. Well, how did the early church deal with it? Because they, they did have it. 
Yes. Uh, there was a Jewish Gentile divide, and then mm -hmm. there were uh, lots of other ethne <laughs> yes. uh, involved. H how did they deal with it? Well, in the writings of Paul, he kept exhorting them to be one. And he said there's neither Jew nor Greek, male or female. And the idea really is whatever it is that you're defining distinction in Christ, we ought to come together, work together, love one another. And together we're a corporate expression of who Jesus is in the earth. So Paul, actually, his church in Rome was a guy who, as a prisoner, converted uh, his prison guards. And the church in uh, Rome had all kinds of people who were slaves, teaching people that were free. So our history is we've eclipsed, eclipsed social barriers. That's our history and our background. If we can unify the church in America as a united force, we could then bring healing to a very divided land. Well, what you're saying actually goes against uh, either the current practice yes. or against even missiology. Yes. You know, the, the keys to church growth are all about finding community of like-minded people. And yes. that usually means same race, yeah, same, same economic, economic status. Exactly. And uh, that, uh, that's the key. You want to surround, you want to be surrounded by people that look and act like you. Yeah. Uh, how do you break through that? Well, I think that's where discipleship comes in. I think what we've missed is that when we talk about the kingdom, to someone who gets born again. And by the way, I prayed years ago uh, in a hotel room in Cleveland, Ohio, with your father to receive Jesus. Um, so I think when people get saved, though, they need to see the kind of modeling that was done back there in the 700 Club. Black and a white guy working together, multiple races coming together. If we disciple people in that manner, they won't think it's strange to have friendships and affiliation. So two sides of racism in America is one is individual heart change so that I don't hate you, for example. But then the structural problems in our culture, which means if you've been to prison, you don't get a second chance at life, or if you don't have very good reading skills, you can't get a job. There are many things that we could do collaboratively, collectively as the church to begin to bring forth that healing process. But we, I'm shouting to the nation, hey, everybody, we're one and we're the nation's answer. All right. Um, do we have to be intentional with it? Yes. More than just aspirational, more than just say, OK, I see this in the Bible. There was a unity there. That, yes. that transcended everything and, and that spiritual unity. But yes. f how would you advise a pastor today if they wanted to take their church down this road? Mm -hmm. What do they need to do? Well, at our website, we talk about bridges to peace. So I'll just give you a couple of them. Can't go into all. But I would say pick something you want to do that has short-term, intermediate, and long-term fruit to heal the structural problems of racism. And let's work together in terms of having people of many races worshiping together as much as you can in your church or partnering with other churches. That's where it starts. But I think we've got to be practical and three practical areas, educational reform, folk who don't do well at the third grade in reading, writing, arithmetic, they wind up in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, you can't get a job. My destiny is tied into what I do for a living, my sense of purpose, my value. So what kinds of things could you do in your city to bring jobs? And then criminal justice reform is something that I'm really big on. How can a church, if someone has a heart for helping people, how can they select a couple of people a year to help them return to their families, be discipled in the word, get a good job, stay the course in terms of being there in their family and their community? So that's a broad overview. Well, I, I agree with you on all of them, and um, uh, particularly reforming the criminal justice system. I, yes. I think it's absolutely broken. And, yes. And we're, we're hearing yet again a call, let's get tough on crime or let's yep. get tough on sentence, sentencing, but we're not realizing the overall social impact of that. We, we really aren't. Uh, this coming Tuesday, there's going to be a big meeting with Prison Fellowship. You may know I'm on the board of Prison Fellowship. Chuck Colson started the organization. And we're going to have a justice declaration. And it's simply what you're saying. 
church recognize that we have a, a dog in this fight, meaning we want to show the mercy and love and kindness of God and forgiveness to people who have messed up. And let's not just discard people. Let's be the purveyors and, and extend a second chance to people. And in some very tangible ways, uh, groups like the NAE, uh, Prison Fellowship, the Colson Center, uh, and the Southern Baptist Convention uh, religion ethics groups are coming together just to blow one note and say, let's think about the forgotten who have wound up in prison and let's evangelize them, let's disciple them, let's bring them back into the fold of uh, American destiny. Well, can, can we also fo focus on the legislation? Because I think it needs to start there as well. You that how, how do we, we seem to be locking people up at a record rate. How can we say if, if it's a nonviolent offense, uh, now what do we do? Is, is prison the right way? Yes. Uh, is there another way to go? Well, there's a study that's just coming out. We don't have time to go into it by, by George Barna about our societal ideas. Most people believe that if you go to prison, that you're going to become a better criminal. The average person has gotten that far in their thinking that there may be another way. But I believe that certain groups like Prison Fellowship are doing great advanced work. But you're right. I think we're going to have to, as Christians, put these things on uh, the ballots and look at these kinds of uh, reforms. Remember, take away the box, the idea of checking the box. If you've ever been in prison, if you're looking for a place to stay or a house or apartment, those specific things will require legislation. And all across America, it is not uniform. Um, in D.C., you will have halfway housing opportunities where you can get your life, get a little bit of money, retrain yourself, and then go back to the world. There are some states where you just get sent out, you get a little check, and you're on your own, you're back on your to where own. you came yeah. from. So I think you're right. I think we have to get the message, we're the change agents, and then we need to do some specific things and um, they can come to us at our website. We'll have some specifics. But also great groups like Prison Fellowship um, are doing amazing things. But guess what? This is, will not surprise you. Until there's a demand made on the political, which is maybe your point, yeah. until the church says, hey, we're going to vote you out of office at a local to the presidential level. If you don't do something about it, it's not going to change. So now's the time to change. It's urgent. Democrats and Republicans both see a need. The problem is not enough people are blowing the trumpet from the pew, or I should say from the polling booth, right? Uh, <laughs> and from the pulpit. <laughs> yeah, and for the pulpit. Yeah, let's, let's, let's blow the shofar on this one, and yeah, yes. let's get together. All right, well, let's do that. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll be glad to work with you. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you for being with us. Well, coming up next, we'll be answering your email questions. Don't go away. Well, we want you to know the story of how Israel reunified Jerusalem during the Six-Day War. You don't understand today's headlines unless you know this history. And now you can own a DVD of the movie In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. All, all we're asking for is a donation of $15. You can give more if you want to, but $15, and you can have the DVD. If you'd like it, call us, one 800 700,000, or you can go to CBN.com. And it's time for Bring It On. You've it got some questions. It is time for Bring It On. This first one comes from John Gordon, who says, I've been doing a study on the elect of God, which teaches God has chosen those he will save. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord, and I believe that the Holy Spirit guides me. I do my best to live for God. Does that mean I am the elect of God? And does God really predestine those who will be saved, or can anyone be saved? I'm not yeah. sure on a television yeah. show. On your mark, I'm going to be able to yeah. you know, go into deep, deep into Calvinism and deep into what's called Arminianism. That it's, you know, it's for everyone. Uh, in God's foreknowledge, He knows. Uh, and um, the the wonderful thing is, we need to have in our minds and in our hearts that for God so loved the world, that means everyone. He gave his only begotten son. Keep in mind, 
God desires that none should perish. So uh, I've, I've simplified it in a very simple statement. When I preach, I'm Armenian. <laughs> I tell everybody it, the door is open for you. When I pray, I'm a Calvinist. Uh, God, you chose me. You got me into this. <laughs> and you, I need you to help me right now. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one way to approach it, that uh, when, you go to, when you go to God in prayer, you're his chosen beloved one that he chose from the foundation of the earth. When you go to people who are not in uh, fellowship with God, you declare to them the good news, that they can have an open door. Uh, they can go boldly to the throne of grace and receive salvation. Okay, this next one comes from Karen who says, My husband and I have been married for over 20 years, and I cannot stand the mental and emotional abuse that he puts me through on a daily basis. I've tried counseling, but he refuses as he doesn't, quote, have any problems. I know that the Bible says marriage is until death do you part, but I'm wondering what to do. I feel like leaving him would be best, but isn't that against his will for us? Uh, God hates divorce. Uh, it's really clear in the Bible. You, you're not telling me all about your marriage. Do you have children? Uh, one of the reasons God hates divorce, the reason, is he wants righteous children. And even adult children uh, have emotional impact when divorce uh, happens in the family. So uh, there are specific biblical uh, reasons for divorce. I, from your description, I, I can't tell you one way or another on that. Uh, I don't. I do believe people, you know, don't have to live in a situation where there's constant abuse. And boundaries are good, and you can make certain requirements. I don't know your financial means. Do you have the ability to move out? There are steps short of divorce uh, where you issue wake-up calls that unless you change, I, I'm a human being. I do not deserve to be treated this way. Uh, and if you're going to treat me this way, uh, I need to live somewhere else. Um, so financially, can you afford to do that? Can you set those kinds of boundaries? Uh, and when those boundaries are violated, uh, then, then you've got to take it to other levels. But uh, there are things short of divorce that you can do. This is a viewer who says, what does Philippians 2.12 mean when it says to, quote, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Uh, that's a that's a tough one too, and I got 40 seconds. Um, the 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 idea here is don't presume on the grace of God. Uh, don't go out and say I now have a license to sin. I can do anything I want. Uh, honor the Lord and live a life of righteousness, and realize He is a consuming fire, fear and trembling. Uh, approach him with awe and reverence uh, and preserve your soul. Here's a word from John. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you.